So the ECG for today is this one. Does anybody want to have a look at this ECG and tell me what they make of it? So what do you think of this ECG? While you're looking at that, I've had a couple of people come back to me saying they had difficulty getting their certificates for attending. Um, most people seem to be getting them OK, but if you are, then I can separately send you a copy of your certificate. Uh, so don't uh, be put off using that because it's great to have the feedback. And uh, you know, I'm also here that you like having a certificate to say you attended. Um, and please invite your friends, uh, anybody who wants to attend is very welcome to listen into these uh, presentations. So does anybody want to tell me something about this ECG? So just any, so a tachycardia, we've got a, a sinus tachycardia offered. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's a tachycardia and the next thing I want you to tell me is, is it narrow complex or broad complex? So I think that uh, everyone's going to be happy that this is a narrow complex tachycardia. Now the next question is what is causing this narrow complex tachycardia and there are obviously lots of possibilities one of which is sinus tachycardia and sometimes P waves can become merged with the T wave because of the tachycardia but there'd have to be quite a long PR interval for the P wave to be merged with the, the T wave. And can you see the T wave is symmetrical? So there's no suggestion that it's lopsided because of a T wave, a, a P wave on top of it. So I doubt this is a sinus tachycardia on that basis. Can anybody suggest anything else? Can they see anything else in this ECG? <clears throat> So what can anybody suggest an alternative cause of a narrow complex tachycardia? So we could obviously have atrial fibrillation. Ah, Ben has suggested a junctional or an AVNRT. So yes, you can have a junctional tachycardia. That's relatively rare. We normally just get a junctional rhythm, but we can certainly have an AVNRT. So what points us towards an AVNRT rather than fast AF or atrial flutter or something, something else? Good, so no P waves and regular. So if it was atrial fibrillation, we would expect it to be irregular. If it was a sinus tachycardia, we would expect to see P waves. Um, can you see here in lead two, this dip here between the QRS and the T wave? That is very likely to be an inverted P wave. So the P wave, if you get the sinus node where the natural pacemaker is, where the heart rhythm is supposed to originate, you get an upright P wave. But if the P wave is coming from lower down, it can be conducted backwards up through the atrium, causing an inverted P wave. And here, this is highly likely to be an inverted P wave because it doesn't make sense for that to be part of the T wave at that point. Um, you'd know for sure if you had an ECG in normal sinus rhythm, if that bit was uh, you know, not visible, uh, then you'd know that this was a, the P wave and that it was being caused by the tachycardia. <clears throat> um, and this highly suggestive of an AVNRT. The other thing that it could be is an atrioventricular reentry tachycardia. Now I'll talk about that another time, but for now I want to tell you a quick bit about AVNRT. They're common. They're a common reason why people do um, 
uh, EP studies and, and ablations, probably about a quarter of people have the capacity to develop an AVNRT. And the way to make the diagnosis is to give some adenosine and look at the ECG and see that it terminates. Um, or you could do valsalva or carotid sinus massage, obviously care with carotid sinus massage. Your AV node has got two pathways in it, in the people who have the capacity to have an AVRT. It has a fast pathway and a slow pathway. And what happens is that the signal in the uh, atrium is normally conducted through the fast pathway, and the tortoise, the slow pathway, never gets a look in because the hair has already got round to the his bundle by the time this trundles round. And so this tissue has been depolarized, is not ready to go again, and uh, the slow pathway never gets to do anything. However, if you have an atrial ectopic beat, so a premature atrial impulse, the fast pathway, the hair, is busy having a breather. It's tired, it can't go. Whereas our slow tortoise is always ready to go. So the early stimulus stimulates the slow pathway, which trundles slowly round the AV node and stimulates the ventricle. However, the slow pathway has taken so long to get to the ventricle that the fast pathway is recovered and heart muscle tissue will very happily conduct in both directions. So the fast hair runs the wrong way round to the atrium and stimulates the atrium. The slow pathway is always good to go, so the slow pathway then gets stimulated again. So we trundle round, stimulate the ventricle, shoot back up to the atrium, stimulate the atrium, trundle round, stimulate the ventricle. And depending upon the speed of these pathways, the P wave will be inverted, but maybe buried in the QRS or just after it, commonly just after it. So this is an AVNRT. And the way the EP specialists do deal with this is to burn the slow pathway so that it no longer exists and that cures people. Great, so welcome everybody. I'm recording this session, so please uh, let me know if you have any issues with that. I'll try and send around a link to make it available to you. Please do sign in on the links that I've been sending around. It's great to be able to keep track of numbers and even better if you can uh, get a certificate for attending by doing the uh, quick bit of feedback and getting your certificate. So this talk is going to cover 24-hour ECGs and if we have time I'll talk a bit about exercise tests as well. 24-hour ECGs. So in, in this, um, we're going to cover lots of different types of monitoring because uh, rather than just 24-hour ECGs, what I'm really talking about here is, is remote cardiac monitoring. In classic 24-hour ECGs, three leads on um, the, the patient and they connect up to a box about the size of a mobile phone. They walk around with it for 24 hours and then they deliver it for analysis. We can do these for a week if we want to, but it means the technicians spend a lot longer recording or uh, interpreting the recordings, so seven times as long to interpret. So we tend to prefer to keep to 24 or 48 hours. These are great if you're trying to look for something like uh, a palpitation occurring on a daily basis uh, that lasts for a few seconds. If you do a loop monitor, very often the patient doesn't find their activator by the time that they've uh, had their symptoms clear up. And although they record a couple of minutes before the episode, as well as obviously a couple of minutes after the episode, often people miss them. Whereas if, uh, if the arrhythmia is occurring once or twice a, a week, a, a longer period of monitoring with a loop monitor might be helpful, but if it's daily a 24-hour tape, very useful. Very useful also for looking for rate control of atrial fibrillation or looking to see if uh, there are arrhythmias in patients with uh, something like a ventricular ectopic beat type description of palpitations that are occurring very often. We can also fit quite clever little devices like this. Uh, does the same thing, but it's a lot slicker. Um, they were selling these in, at a conference I went to when they first launched it, and there were a load of, uh, of models walking around demonstrating these devices to us. It was quite a strange, surreal experience uh, looking at drugs one moment and turning around to see one of these devices in action uh, the next moment. So these are alternatives. We also can implant loop recorders, and we used to put these quite big things in around where we put pacemakers. Now these little injectable loop recorders we put just uh, to the left of the sternum and uh, they can be injected last for about 
two or three years the battery and it will record anything that occurs during that two or three years. Very important still for patients to activate the device and to contact us when they've had an arrhythmia, otherwise the memories get overwritten. Uh, but they also have remote monitoring, so we might get a phone call from the technicians to say a patient I put one of these devices in two years ago has had a 10 second pause and that you know, obviously uh, would need to have a pacemaker put in. So very useful uh, way of diagnosing infrequent arrhythmias. And rather than doing lots of lengthy periods of monitoring, we do tend to go more and more for these devices because they're so simple and quick and then they last the duration. <clears throat> so why do we do 24-hour ECGs? Um, well, very obviously, we want to diagnose the cause of the arrhythmia. And it's so critical to have symptom rhythm correlation because very often when patients have palpitations they don't have any significant arrhythmia going on and if you can capture their heart rhythm while they've got their palpitations and demonstrate that it's not showing any significant arrhythmia that gives you as much help in reassuring the patient as um, you know, making a positive diagnosis of something else might. Uh, so very very useful to have a symptom rhythm correlation, symptoms correlated with what the heart rhythm is doing at the time of their symptoms. <clears throat> And that links into the evaluation of symptoms uh, sort of comment here. We then might want to assess how effective our treatment has been. So let's say a patient has ventricular ectopic beats. It's always uh, amazing. Some patients have every other beat as a ventricular ectopic. So they have a 50% ventricular ectopic beat burden and they are blissfully unaware of them, even though it's causing them a cardiomyopathy. Whereas other people get one or two and are terribly symptomatic. Everyone is different, but uh, we can evaluate how effective we've been at suppressing, uh, the, for example, tachybrady syndrome, fast AF, how far, but how good we are at controlling fast AF. Um, we could assess how good we are at suppressing ventricular ectopic beat frequency. And then you can do other things like assess autonomic function with a 24-hour ECG, but that would be a less typical reason for doing so. So now I'd like you to tell me what normal is. So can anybody tell me what normal looks like on a 24-hour ECG? So do you think any of these are normal? Now, I've never had any formal teaching on 24-hour ECG analysis, so you're much more fortunate than me to actually get some formal teaching on it. And I, the point I want to make here is that we're not very good at knowing what normal is because we haven't done studies of normal people with 24-hour ECGs. I'm not sure I'd want to participate in a study of uh, you know, having a 24-hour ECG done to see what normal is, because you might find things that, you know, given I'm completely asymptomatic, do you really want to do anything with that? So we're not so good at knowing what normal is on a 24-hour ECG. Um, what we can be much better at is knowing what is abnormal. So that's what I want you to sort of concentrate on remembering. And the first thing is to think about your patient. If your patient is frail, bed bound, you wouldn't want to do anything more to them if you could at all avoid it, then do you really want to do a 24 hour ECG and find something that requires you to send them to cardiology to have a pacemaker put in? Um, it's probably better not to do the test in the first place, unless you think that the arrhythmia is the reason why they're so frail. Uh, there are, every year there'll be an elderly patient who is uh, in complete heart block, uh, unbeknownst to them, and that's the reason why they've become bed bound. And if you spot that and pace them, they can rejuvenate. So I'm always a bit wary when somebody comes in very frail in complete heart block. Is it the uh, complete heart block causing the frailty or is that incidental? I clearly don't want the last act in a patient's uh, medical career to be a pacemaker shortly before they uh, they do very badly uh, but equally I don't want to deny somebody the chance to be rejuvenated and it, uh, it becomes important in those situations to try and look for an acute change in symptoms. 
So consider the patient, and if you think that it's uh, they're, they're somebody you want to find something uh, to deal with, then obviously you can can uh, can can do the heart monitor. Um, as I've said before, correlating symptoms with the heart rhythm is really important because, for example, if you've got a two second pause and that's causing severe symptoms, or if you've got a ventricular ectopic beat that's causing severe symptoms, that's a different matter from uh, a patient who's got those and they're asymptomatic. Incidentally, pauses don't tend to cause symptoms. Um, they well, they tend to cause blackouts, so you don't tend to feel lightheaded with a two second pause. You probably don't with a three or four second pause, but when it gets up to about five seconds, that's where you black out and break your hip. So what is abnormal? Uh, Non-sustained VT is considered to be abnormal. So three beats or more of ventricular ectopics all together, that counts as non-sustained VT. It's one of those uh, non-sustained VT is up to 30 seconds of VT is non-sustained or three or more beats. So 30 seconds might be, if your rate's 200, that might be 60 beats of, of VT is still non-sustained. So remember, just three ventricular ectopic beats counts as non-sustained VT, and that does mean that I'm just a little bit concerned. If they've got LV impairment, I'm more concerned. If their LV function is normal, then I might not really know what to do with it. Heart block two to one or third degree heart block that is definitely abnormal on a 24 hour ECG requires a pacemaker. So heart block even brief and even if it's just at night and even if it's asymptomatic, that is a sign that they will either have a long pause and hurt themselves or even have a systole. So heart block always is abnormal and needs attention. Uh, more than three second pauses during the day, uh, night time, probably more like five seconds is what we're looking for. You very rarely get an isolated three second pause. You'll more often see lots and lots of shorter pauses and there's one longer one. And that's the sort of thing that makes us want to prophylactically put in a pacemaker unless we can adjust treatment that's causing the bradyarrhythmias. And the other thing you should always be aware of is atrial fibrillation because that clearly requires assessment and um, anticoagulation if appropriate. So let's have some examples. We've got a patient complaining of palpitations and so you have a 24-hour ECG. Now there are certain bits of this that I would guide you towards because there's a lot of information on there. You can find out things like um, the length of the recording time, um, obviously you can check the patient's name is appropriate. There are other boxes, the uh, number of normal beats, well you know do we really care about that number? Not really. You can see things like uh, pauses, that can be useful to look at down here if that's zero, so the pauses box there, and the aberrant total here, that's a useful one, so the number of ventricular uh, ectopic beats uh, is is up there. So that's an important one to be aware of. And the percentage of the total is important. If you get over about 10% of the total, then that can be causing a cardiomyopathy. And anybody with over about 5%, unless they are not uh, physically a well patient, I'd be wanting to be aware of and be trying to do something about. This patient is 18, so that's not very many, but uh, maybe that's enough to be causing symptoms. Try and reduce resist the temptation to rush to look at the technician report because it's always worth having the ability to interpret these things to some extent yourself. So the really the two places I look, ventricular ectopic beats and the pauses. And then I move on to the next page. And the next page, oh, I've highlighted those. The next page, this is the most useful page of the whole report. And the bit that you want to look at is not this rows of numbers there, which is pretty useless for your purposes. But this is what you want to look at. This is the heart rate profile over a 24 hour period. And can you see we've got heart rate over here? So we've got rates of over 80. We go up to 89 here. We've got the minimum heart rate going down to 46 over here. So that's our heart rate range. And this solid line is our mean heart rate, which they've put up there at 62. 
And then there's time here. So it was put on shortly after one o'clock in the afternoon and it was on for a full 24 hour period. So by looking at that, on the front page, if you'd looked very quickly, you might have seen about heart rate, about normal beat numbers, et cetera, et cetera. All of that don't really care about because I can see that through this graph here, but I can't see the number of ventricular ectopics and pauses, which is why I go and look at the other two numbers. Here, can you see that the heart rate is quite variable? It changes throughout the 24 hour period and it dips during the night. That's normal. It's supposed to dip during the night. A young person, very often their heart rate will go down to about 30 overnight. That's a perfectly normal finding. Um, this heart rate variability, this nocturnal dip, that tells us that the patient's autonomic function is good. And that points away from them needing a pacemaker. Um, if there's, this is very flat, then that is, is a concern. The patient's not so well for one reason or another. It might be they've had long-standing diabetes causing autonomic dysfunction. Or it might just be a reflection of the fact that they're a poorly patient. Um, don't, don't, can't do anything specific about that. We don't do 24-hour ECGs to look for that, but it's something to be aware of when you've done one. So this is a very normal 24-hour ECG so far. And then having looked at that, we then look at the ECG recordings. And the most useful bit to be looking at is the patient events. So can you see the technician is very helpfully recorded and the, the patient event in the printout for us. And you can see here there are two ventricular ectopic beats occurring after the intrinsic rhythm and that's occurring on a number of occasions and this in particular has caused the symptoms. So we also want to have a look at the symptom diary and the symptom diary describes very brief palpitations at different times and one of them matches up perfectly with this event that we've had recorded to us. So we know this patient is having ventricular ectopic beats, we know that they don't have very many of them and we can reassure the patient that this is a normal finding and nothing to worry about. We could give them a beta blocker to try and suppress them, but we can already see that the heart rate mean is 62. So we probably don't want to give this patient any beta blockers because they'll be symptomatic because of their bradycardia, the next thing. So I would just leave this alone if you can. Great, that makes sense so far. Any questions, please put them in on the chat as we go along if you do. Moving on to example two, and now we've skipped the opening page and gone straight to the uh, the, the bit that I, I recommend you go to 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 find out the uh, what's going on. This patient is complaining of palpitations. So now I've taken you through one 24 hour ECG. Now your experts, can you interpret this 24 hour ECG for me? What does this show? Can anybody type something in the chat or unsilence themselves and offer something? So can you see the maximum heart rate 120, minimum heart rate 47 and the mean heart rate of 73? Ah, perfect. Very good. Thank you, Anna. So can you see that there are episodes of tachycardia and there are episodes of bradycardia? And look how abrupt the transitions are between the two. It's not like the one I showed you a second ago where it gradually goes up. I mean, obviously, this is a 24 hour period. So gradual, you know, even a relatively steep line is means gradual. But here in this one, it just suddenly the rate shoots up and suddenly the rate shoots down again. And this immediately is going to point you towards there being potentially two different heart rhythms. And what you want to see is the transition between the two. And you also want to see episodes of both so that you know what's going on. So you know from this, they've got episodes of tachycardia, episodes of bradycardia, and you want to then have a look at the ECGs. So you then turn the page and what can you see on this ECG? So can anybody tell me what the top ECG shows, the bottom ECG shows? <clears throat> Good. 
Good. So the top shows fast atrial fibrillation. Uh, so we've got an irregularly irregular. The, the, we've got the irregular, regular tachycardia here, rate of 121. And the bottom one, the bottom one's a bit more awkward. I don't want to labour this too much, but um, can you see here we've got a different morphology of the P wave here compared to here? And can you see the P waves are quite slow in this patient, but there's a very different um, heart rate or, or interval between P waves between that one and this one. This tells us this is an atrial ectopic and it's occurring too early to be conducted. So that's why we uh, have then got a compensatory pause that you usually get after an ectopic while the atrium recovers and gets ready to go again. So this is a, a sinus bradycardia with atrial ectopics, although if you thought that that was two episodes of two to one heart block, you would be safe in making that assumption because I could certainly see why you might struggle to d distinguish those two things. But this is a bradycardia in the night. So we have episodes of nocturnal um, bradycardia at six o'clock in the morning. We've got episodes of daytime tachycardia. What are we going to do about this? So do you want to give the patient a beta blocker? Do you want to give them some digoxin? Do you want to put in a pacemaker? Do you want to leave well alone? So the problem with this is you need to know symptoms. And if the patient is asymptomatic, then we do nothing. We can tolerate some short runs of tachycardia. Rates are only very, very briefly going up to 120. They're mainly below 100, so they're fine. So thank you. That's uh, a nice thorough answer, Emmanuel. So, uh, and uh, and Chad Vask, yes, very good, Ravi and Tom. So uh, really important to think about anticoagulation for this patient. Let's not get so excited with the tachybrady issues that we forget to, to do the thing which will be life prolonging and prevent them having strokes. So if we need to do something in terms of medication, we may well end up having to put in a pacemaker. We might try a little bit of beta blocker to see if that uh, is enough to damp down the tachycardias. Good. So how about this example? So this is another patient with palpitations. What do you think of this ECG? What would you do if you were working in general practice or you were um, you were working in a, a medical specialty or a surgical specialty and you'd foolishly requested a 24-hour ECG of this 50-year-old um, patient who happened to in passing mention palpitations? So, uh, sorry, people incessantly phoning for somebody else. So what we've said is VT. So is this sustained or non-sustained VT? And Ben is wanting to admit, you won't go too far wrong if you admit this patient, but is that the thing we should immediately do? So these are non-sustained. Well, you can't see the origin, so we can't say if this has been 30 seconds or not. But on the basis that the 24 ECG, this is probably about 10 seconds. No, in fact, this is less. It's more like about six, uh, eight seconds worth across the 24 ECG. So we we don't know, but it looks likely to be non-sustained from the episodes that we can see on here. Um, the fact that the patient has been walking around complaining of palpitations suggests that you don't need to phone an immediate uh, ambulance for them. But this is the sort of ECG that makes you worried that the patient is going to be at, at risk of sudden death. So I would recommend phoning up the patient and finding out a little bit about their symptoms. I'd recommend having a look at their medical record to check that this isn't known about and they don't already have an ICD in. Um, 
but this is the kind of patient who needs an admission. Uh, so this patient was admitted and uh, had an echocardiogram done, which showed that they had severe LV impairment and they uh, got an ICD, but they also got medications to suppress the ventricular tachycardia. So something like that, just the same day, it needs an immediate assessment to work out what's, uh, what's going on. And almost certainly this patient needs an admission or discussion with cardiology. Very good. So what about this example? So Emmanuel's asked about the medication. So really good for suppressing VT or beta blockers. So that's the first line. If you need to do more than that, we might think about amiodrone, but it's quite a toxic drug long term. And we can also think about things like flecainide, uh, but uh, beta blockers, definitely the first line. Good. So example four, uh, does anybody tell me what they think is going on here? So this time round, we've got some really pretty fast heart rates as well as bradycardias. And this is the sort of patient that whether they're symptomatic or not, and it's highly likely that they are, we need to improve upon the rate control. And the fact that there's an abrupt transition between the two and the duration of this, this isn't likely that they were exercising for this length of time. The fact that it's going up and down strongly points towards this being atrial fibrillation, so paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So this patient will definitely need rate control, whether they're symptomatic or not. Um, I won't uh, go through the ECGs because I think we uh, would interpret those quite effectively. Instead, let's move on and imagine that you're working on the weekend on Ward 28 and you're asked by the nurse to come and see this patient um, because they, they're very concerned about the heart monitor. So what would you do? Imagine you're on call tonight, you're at 8.26 in the morning feeling rather tired and not really wanting to get too involved in the patient. Um, but what do you do about this? So this looks pretty ugly, doesn't it? So, so far, um, judging by the speed of the reactions, not a lot. Are you happy to, to leave this patient? Um, so, oh, sorry, Dr. Al has suggested this is looks a bit like VF. So yes, it does look a bit like VF. Um, and Sabrina's dialing twos, very good. So you're getting help urgently. Ben thinks this is torsade de point. Uh, it's an interesting spelling of point. Uh, interestingly, knowing how many S's to put on torsade de point is a, a, a very interesting one. And even French people can't tell you which of those words needs to have an S on the end. So you've put one in all three, which is generous. Great. Uh, so good suggestions there. What would you do? You, you're, you're phoning twos, Sabrina. Do you want to do anything before you get as far as phoning twos? Does anybody want to? Yes, first assess the patient. Excellent. Do an A, B, C. So this patient is actually wondering what all the fuss is about because the nurse has been to see them and uh, you know, asked, are they feeling OK? Now you're rushing to see them and looking rather concerned about them. Can you suggest to me anything else that might be going on here? Ah, very good, Sarah. So is the patient brushing their teeth? So of course it is 8.26 in the morning. What more natural thing to do than to brush your teeth at 8.26 in the morning? And that is indeed what is happening. Now the clue is if you look 
these three strips are recorded simultaneously. And can you look at the QRS complexes in the third lead? You can't really see them in the top two, but in the third lead, you can see them nice and clearly at the start. And then you can see that the noise is not being transmitted quite so much into this lead. And so what you might have thought if this was a true VT, maybe that's a fusion beat and there's a capture beat coming through over here. But you can see actually that there is no pause at all in the uh, the ventricular activity so it would be impossible to have vt coming through like this and to still have the qrs is occurring like this regularly in, in in this way so this is just the patient brushing their teeth um and uh and, and nothing for you to be concerned about but one thing you should spot is that this patient is in atrial fibrillation uh, so it needs anticoagulation. Great. So always look out for uh, very ugly looking ECGs. And I agree with you entirely. This looks a bit like torsade de poil. It might be ventricular fibrillation, but don't be fooled by simple noise. So that's what I want to tell you about 24-hour ECGs. Um, please ask any questions uh, on the chat uh, or uh, you know, I'm very happy to, uh, to go into more depth on anything if you are after it. Um, just as a way of a bit of uh, light relief, if anybody is interested in doing some research, it's amazing what you can use 24-hour ECGs to, to, uh, to research. So this is an example of uh, Care of the Elderly uh, Registrar who did uh, electrocardiographic monitoring during digital rectal examination. So uh, all sorts of ways in which you can use these techniques. So think out of the box when uh, when you come to do research. Um, so moving on to exercise tolerance tests. Um, how many of you supervise exercise tolerance tests? I would imagine most of you at some stage or other get to do this. Um, the Vogue for exercise tolerance tests has somewhat diminished in recent years. Leicester's a bit behind the curve. Uh, nice guidelines recommend CT scans, cardiac CTs. Um, I am a big, big fan of exercise tolerance tests. I'm always a bit sceptical when doctors come up with expensive, cool new ways of doing um, what a boring old exercise tolerance test can do. And the problem is that you end up with a big wig uh, who writes the guidelines, who's a big fan of their pet test, and they uh, get to introduce it to the guidelines because they've got an axe to grind and you can interpret data any way you like. And the poor, humble exercise tolerance test doesn't really have too many champions out there, so it gets maligned and pushed to one side. Exercise tolerance tests are really, they're great tests in patients capable of exercising. And if you're not capable of exercising, are you that likely to, to do hugely well from being investigated by cardiologists? Yeah, possibly. Uh, obviously, you need to think carefully about the patient. Uh, but exercise tolerance tests they were fatal. They did a study looking to see if exercise tests added to clinical opinion of cardiologists about whether a patient was ischemic or not. And surprise, surprise, it turned out that if a cardiologist thought the patient had ischemic heart disease, they probably did have ischemic heart disease and an exercise test didn't add to that. Now that's a pretty tough uh, bar to use against any tests. Most of the time we're doing tests where I, I was always taught and I, I love this description, you should use tests the way that a drunkard uses a lamppost for support rather than for illumination. So we don't do tests because we don't have a clue what's going on. We do tests to confirm what we think is going on. Um, so exercise tests have been a bit uh, pushed out by, by that. And instead we do CT scans, which show that the patient has lots of incidental omas and it leads to lots of further tests. But if you have the privilege to supervise an exercise test, you should be aware that we do it mainly to look for ischemic heart disease but also we still do it to look to see if it provokes VT or other arrhythmias. Um, and we do it to assess symptoms. And if you can do a good exercise test, it's a really helpful indicator of prognosis. If you don't do a very good exercise test, then it becomes we'll need to do another investigation. So um, example one, 
we have a 55 year old woman who is overweight and has diet controlled diabetes type 2. She's got breathlessness and exertional chest tightness. So this is her exercise test result minus the writing by one of my esteemed colleagues on it, which would give the game away somewhat. <clears throat> And can you see that she has exercised for three minutes of stage one and for one minute, eight seconds of stage two? Now, we use something called the full Bruce protocol, which has got four stages in it. And stage one, you're walking slowly. Stage two, a little bit faster. Even stage four, you're not walking particularly fast, but the steepness markedly goes up to so stage four you're walking up something like a 15 percent gradient so it's really quite steep even though you're not walking that fast it's a walk rather than a jog um, and you expect patients really unless they're extremely unfit to get out of stage two and uh, you know fit even a uh, patient in their 60s or 70s if they're fit should manage stage four not not that many of our patients do of course so you're looking at how long they've exercised for. So this patient's total exercise time is four minutes, eight seconds. We're looking at the heart rate. Can you see it starts off at 92? It rapidly increases to 156. And we're looking at their blood pressure. Again, it starts off fairly normal, high diastolic and shoots up. That's we, what we expect to see with exercise. <coughs> We can then see that the heart rate comes down reasonably rapidly and the rate at which the patient recovers after exercise is, uh, is a prognostic factor. And we're looking to see have they reached 85% of their maximum predicted heart rate. So this 55 year old lady's maximum predicted heart rate is 165. So unless she gets to 140, we consider her not to have done sufficient exercise. And you can see that even though she didn't exercise for very long, she hit the target or exceeded the target. So this is a sufficient exercise, although it's a suggestive that she's not achieved very much and suggests either there was a pathology that stopped her or this lady's really very unfit. So this is what the ECG looks like at baseline. So before we've started. And can you see we're looking for ST depression, ST elevation. And that looks pretty much OK, I would suggest to you. As exercise increases. She develops some ST depression. And how do I get rid of that bar that's irritating me? Come down and is covering over the uh, time. This is at four minutes. So this is in stage two of the full bruise exercise test. So what does everybody think of this ECG? We're looking for evidence of ST depression and we've found it, haven't we? Do we think this patient has ischemic heart disease? So the answer which I'm looking for is that upsloping ST depression is generally speaking not of concern, particularly in ladies. And the next question is, is she premenopausal or postmenopausal? Because interestingly, postmenopausal female exercise tests are much more like men's and easier to interpret. Premenopausal, um, there is much more by way of upsloping ST depression, and so they become harder to interpret. And we may prefer to do a different test first rather than doing this test and ending up requesting another one. So if you want to see what the technician reported, Again, try and interpret yourself, but they've said they tried hard, got very short of breath, reached the appropriate heart rate. Then they developed some central chest discomfort late in stage one, which radiated to the throat in stage two. This is a borderline exercise test. They've said negative. And I would agree with them that although this chest discomfort is a bit troubling, um, that ECG is negative. That's what we might expect to see in an 80 in a 55 year old lady. Um, very esteemed colleague thought that there were some 
ST changes. So this is why exercise tests have fallen out of favour a bit, because they can be difficult to interpret. I would have said, I don't need to do anything further with this. My colleague felt we did. The bottom line was she didn't have ischemic heart disease in the end, but that doesn't mean that he was right or I was right. It uh, simply means that the, the events of that were that nothing needed to be done. And this is where the detection the sensitivity is about 80%, specificity is about 70%. So it's not all that high, but the problem here is it depends upon your patient cohort. If you get an obese 55 year old lady to do it who can barely get out of stage one, you end up with quite a hard to interpret exercise test. If you have um, a uh, fitter patient um, who should be able to get into stage three, then actually it becomes much more sensitive and specific. Um, CT scanning, which is now the first line thing, that runs into lots of problems with coronary calcification as you get diabetic patients or patients with renal impairment. So it can be very useful in just the cohort of patients who'll do you a good exercise test. But in patients who aren't going to do you a good exercise test, who tend to be in their 60s and 70s, who tend to have coronary artery disease, these are the sort of patients who end up with a CT scan, which is unhelpful. And because of calcification, as soon as the artery is calcified, it's very hard to say is it severely narrowed or not. So this is where we can do something like a myocardial perfusion scan or a stress MRI scan or a stress echo. Those are our alternatives. Um, I've said a bit about the Bruce protocol already. Um, I won't say anything more about that. Um, that's a little bit about the amount of oxygen consumption. Preparing the patient, we tend in the past, we used to stop beta blockers. Nowadays, we just carry them on for the most part. It does um, mean that getting to the 85% of predicted heart rate can be challenging. So if they have got bradycardia, um, it's best to still discontinue them the day before the test. Um, digoxin confuses the results. So we, we probably don't do an exercise test on digoxin because you can end up with reverse tick type ECG changes with digoxin, which can be very confusing. Um, also, we think about the antianginals the patient might be on. Uh, it's generally speaking fine to continue these. Uh, we said about maximum age predicted heart rate. So your age predicted heart rate is 220 minus your age. We're aiming for 85% and it's a good thing if you can exercise to the point of uh, getting uh, the uh, to your age predicted heart rate. So example two, we now this time have a 50 year old man who's a smoker who's had a one week history of exertional chest tightness. And this is a gentleman who's usually reasonably fit. So this is just the sort of patient, even though he clearly smokes, um, this is just the sort of person exercise test is a really useful measure on. So this time around, can you see on this screen that we have got our resting heart rate and our blood pressure? And as he exercises, heart rate doesn't increase very, very much. We've not come close to our maximum heart rate or 85% of maximum heart rate of 130. So we would consider this to be an insufficient exercise test. And he's only exercised to 23 seconds of the full boost protocol. You. Sorry about that. Um, so, so let's have a look and see what these ECGs show. So again, this is his best baseline ECG. Can you see that uh, normal QRS, no evidence of ischemia on that ECG? And then this is just at the start of exercise. Nothing too much going on. And then three minutes into the full bridge protocol, just before three minutes in, can you see that there is some ST depression developing? And can you see that that ST depression is quite widespread? And if you look in V4, that's about two or three millimeters. So that is ST depression in the anterior leads. We also have a bit of ST depression over here inferiorly. 
the regional regionality of that ST depression doesn't actually help you localize which coronary artery is at risk, but this is very strongly pointing towards ischemia in this gentleman who ought to have been able to get comfortably into to stage three uh, past six minutes. Um, so this is a very positive exercise test. Everybody happy with that? Anybody want to add any other statements to this? So the other thing that we also want to look for is, is there any ST elevation? And it's all starting to look as if it might be going up in V1. ST elevation can be, uh, it, it's not an infarct during an exercise test, although there is a risk of causing an infarct. You can have transient ST elevation without troponin release, but that would be a very bad prognostic sign. So one millimeter of ST elevation is enough to make you stop whatever else you're seeing. Um, so is it changing? You should be watching out for that. So these changes persist into recovery. This is, um, where is our stage time? This is a minute into recovery. Um, then we've got, this is uh, seven minutes into recovery. You can't see that at the top. So they've taken quite a while to recover. So a strongly positive exercise test. This patient needs to have an urgent coronary angiogram. They can still have it as an outpatient if they've got stable symptoms of angina, uh, but there's no question this patient needs to go for coronary angiography because we have a large study called Courage, which showed that patients were fine to be managed medically if they got in stage two without showing symptoms, but if they had ST depression before the end of stage one, before the end of three minutes, they needed to uh, have uh, coronary angiography. What are the contraindications to exercise testing? How can you uh, get out of doing an exercise test if you happen to be supervising a list? Well, they're obvious ones. You don't really need to remember this list because you're not going to do it in somebody with severe aortic stenosis unless you're specifically assessing are they symptomatic from their severe aortic stenosis. Um, you don't do it in somebody who's got angina at rest, it's unstable, unless you want to find out is that angina due to uh, ischemia, but probably not the best test to do for that. Um, you're not going to do it in somebody who's got a dissecting aortic aneurysm or recent aortic surgery, so fairly obvious contraindications. The main one perhaps to remember is the blood pressure over 180, over, over 100. Um, and, and actually these could be reasons to do an exercise test, of course. Um, limitations, as we've said, the ST depression, if it's upsloping, uh, can be present in normal patients. Obviously, if you're incapable of doing an exercise test, it can be very difficult. You can do an exercise test with right bundle branch block. You can't with left bundle branch block. Uh, I think I've got one more example. So this is a 65-year-old man who's had a previous anterior myocardial infarction and then represents with exertional chest pain and his troponin's negative. So uh, we decided to do an exercise test in order to decide was this exertional chest pain angina or was it um, just uh, uh, one of the many non-cardiac causes of chest pain. So this patient, you can see his blood pressure starts off reasonable goes up appropriately, come down appropriately. He exercises for nine minutes of the full bridge exercise, uh, full bridge protocol. His heart rate increases as appropriate. He exceeds his maximum prediction. In fact, exceeds even his maximum heart rate. So we flogged him maybe a little bit hard here. So let's have a look at his images. So does anybody want to comment on that ECG? So what do you think of the anterior leads? Can you see that there is no R wave in V1, 
V2, V3 or V4, it's not until V5 that we start to get an R wave. So these are anterior Q waves, in keeping with the fact that this gentleman's had a previous myocardial infarction, and it shows us a pretty extensive previous myocardial infarction. Now that's going to make this exercise test really quite hard to interpret, and you might have some reticence about supervising this exercise test if you're asked to do one in, in somebody like this. Um, so you'll, you should feel quite nervous at this point in proceedings. Um, then we get them to exercise, and this is um, five minutes, 47 seconds into exercise. This is towards the end of the full Bruce protocol, uh, stage two of the, the protocol. What does everybody think about that ECG? Any concerns about that one? Are we happy with the appearances? So, if you look in, ah, good, thank you. So we have ST depression V4, V5. Yes, I agree, there is a bit of ST depression. And again, this is a bit upsloping. So this doesn't trouble me too much. It's not really positive, but it's, so we, we've not really got anything to make us stop, but we are a little bit concerned about this. And then we exercise a bit more. And what do we think of this? So can you see that now there is definite ST depression? And more importantly, can you see these anterior leads? Can you see the change in appearance of the anterior leads? So now we're looking like there's some ST elevation going on, quite hard to interpret. So this is definitely time to call a halt to this exercise test. And then the patient goes into VT. So they get cardioverted out of that and they have a coronary angiogram and a stent and they do very well. Um, so it was a diagnostic exercise test. But mm, whether or not we should have gone for that as a first line is very hard to say and not something I would cast a judgment on um, without actually having the patient in front of me. Exercise tests can be very, very useful where used appropriately, but there is about a one in 10,000 risk of death or acute MI, and that will depend a bit on the sort of patients you're sending for your exercise test, and about a one in 5,000 of VT or VF. And these patients are the ones with strongly positive, lots of ischemia that uh, really need intervention, really need it to be diagnosed. Normal ECG with exercise tests, we get this upsloping ST depression. So it starts off, this is rest, exercise. It starts to flatten, but isn't really down. And then you get this upsloping. So that's normal appearances. You can remain at stage B uh, all the way through. You can develop C, and that's not an abnormal finding, much like that first exercise test that I showed you. Um, you can have a description of what happens with the uh, ECG changes, but you're basically you're looking for horizontal or downsloping ST depression. And we should be stopping if there is more than two millimeters of ST depression or any ST elevation at all. And obviously arrhythmias or bundle branch, new bundle branch block would make us stop. I don't think you need to remember the last point along that. Also stop if the patient asks you to, if you've got severe chest pain or if you have a drop in blood pressure or very high systolic blood pressure or you're unable to exercise. Uh, what did I put that there? Yes, the blood... Anyway, we'll, we'll move on because I think in, in the interest of time, we record for 15 minutes after the end of exercise testing and if you get ECG changes during recovery, those are just as important as if you had the changes during exercise. Wonderful, that's the end of my slides. We're bang on two o'clock. Does anybody have any quick questions for me about all of that? In the case of the obese lady in the exercise test, would she benefit from MPS to detect ischemia? Well, 
if you knew the result of the exercise test before you started, then I would say probably we're fine to go ahead with the exercise test because we've got a diagnostic test. We've diagnosed her to be unfit and to not have evidence of ischemia. Um, the presence of chest pain makes it a little bit harder and I would want to try and tease out that symptom a bit more. A myocardial perfusion scan wouldn't be a bad choice of investigation for her, but CT scan would probably be okay as well. The fact that she's obese and diabetic does point you towards coronary artery calcification. If she was 65, I would say no, there'll be too much calcification for it to be very helpful, but at 55, it probably would have been useful. So yes, you could have done a myocardial perfusion in the first case, but probably the exercise test gave us enough depending on the symptoms. So please sign in, get your certificates, give me some feedback, tell me what's useful, what's not useful. Please look out for uh, the topics coming up. Thank you very much for listening. Take care, everyone.